A very popular physician of his times, he established Ayurveda in Madurai, and his father, Aryavedan P.V. Raghavarya, the current chairman and chief physician of the group, is great physician and scholar. Dr. Ramesh Varya, the first rank holder in BMS from Madras University in the year 1986, and he doesn't need any introduction. He holds, a, he has an 80 bedded hospital in a plush greeneries with cottages and rooms in Madurai. Seven branches all over India, an international hospital in Malaysia, Malacca. He has 300 products manufactured in the most ethical way, and his research continues. His, successful, his success lies with the modern scientific understanding, which you will realize from his talks, where he backs up tradition with modernization. Dr. Ramesh Varya. Good morning, dignitaries uh, of the dais. I think all of them from the dais have left. So good morning and uh, good morning to all of you and uh, uh, great uh, privilege. Thanks to the organizers of this program for having given me this opportunity to be here in your midst today as we are celebrating the third International Yoga Day and the second International Ayurveda Conference here in Singapore. It's indeed my great privilege to be here. I'm really short of time. I've been given a very tough task of talking about Ayurveda and immune system, combining both modern understanding as well as traditional understanding of how Ayurveda works in immune-related issues. So I'll go straight into the presentation. Immunity is understood to be the balanced state of a multicellular organi organism bestowing adequate biological defenses to fight infections, disease, or other unwanted biological invasions and toxins, while having adequate tolerance to non-disease-causing substances in food, the environment, and more importantly, a clear delineation between the invading organism and one's own tissue. So it's a very comprehensive function that the body has to carry out in terms of protecting itself against all possible invasions. And as, as the definition goes, more importantly, to distinguish between the body's own tissue and the invading organism, because organisms are getting more and more smart. And they're beginning to mimic the body in several ways, which causes several issues to the defense system. The universe of immune disorders comprises of three varieties of issues that can happen with the immune system. First is the underactivity or the immune system is not working as well as it should be, which is manifested in two ways. One is the primary immune deficiency disorders. They are primarily congenital anomalies associated with genetical disorders leading to certain components of the immune system being missing in the body. Since the genetical makeup has been damaged, they are not able to produce those components of the immune system that are required to provide adequate protection. There is then the secondary immunodeficiency disorder. So primarily a person who doesn't have any of those genetic disorders, but over a period of time develops a deficiency in the immunity due to several factors starting from age, immunosuppression uh, with drugs, which are part of treatment of several diseases, due to infections and so on. There are several other factors as well, which I will be dealing with later. So these two represent the underactivity of the immune system which makes a person prone to getting repeated infections and so on. Their ability to fight infections is gone down. The next problem is where the immune system really starts over, becoming overactive, which is called as hypersensitivity. There are four varieties of hypersensitivity. I don't want to go into all those details. It's a little bit technical. So there is a type 1 hypersensitivity which causes allergies. There's a type 2 hypersensitivity which causes damage to certain tissues, which is what happens in certain drug reactions. There's a type 3 where the immune complex, which is formed by the antigen-antibody reaction, as it is called, depositing in certain tissues, damaging the organ, is as like what happens in the case of SLE or uh, glomerulonephritis. The type 4 is called a delayed hypersensitivity, which is what happens in diseases like tuberculosis, syphilis, etc. So all these represent a uh, problem with the immune system, where the immune system is hyperactive. And the third 
which is the growing aspect of the problem, is where the body is misdirected. The immune system is misdirected to attacking the body's own system as opposed to uh, attacking an invading organism. It can be either organ specific, in which case just a specific organ is attached, is attacked by the immune system, like what happens in the case of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which leads to hypothyroidism. Or it can be systemic, where the entire different systems in the body are affected by the disease, like what happens in the case of rheumatoid arthritis or systemic lupus erythematosus or SLE as it's called. So there's a whole spectrum of autoimmune diseases which is becoming the bane of the day. A little bit about primary immunodeficiency. This, as I said earlier, it's primarily inherited and mostly is from the X gene and so males are more likely to suffer from primary immunodeficiency than females. Okay, we can't do much about the primary uh, immunodeficiency because it is inherited. You can only manage it thereafter. Whereas the more important one that is affecting us today is the secondary immune deficiency. And as you can see from the slide, there are several factors that are responsible for developing an improper immune system on the, in the period of time. The factors that commonly affect are infectious diseases like HIV, environmental stress, age uh, extremes like prematurity and old age, Surgery, trauma, splenectomy, etc. Some certain conditions because they deplete the immune system and make the pro person prone to have a lower adaptive or innate immunity. Immunosuppressive drugs which are used very extensively in the treatment of several diseases today. Genetic and metabolic disorders which happen uh, even over the period of time. Metabolic disorders develop and malnutrition is also a cause for adaptive and innate immunity going down. And that leads to the situation of immunodeficiency, wherein the person gets prone to infections and even to tumor. Today, even cancer is understood to be an immune disease because all of us produce cancer cells in the body. And it's with a robust immune system that the body detects this abnormal cell and extinguishes the cancer cells. Whereas when our immune system is down, we are unable to extinguish those abnormal cells and they proliferate in the body, leading to cancer. So secondary immunity related issues are a growing uh, area of problems that we are facing today. But the greatest culprit is autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is a condition where the immune system attacks the tissues of one's own body and thereby damaging them. Though the exact causes are not yet fully known, the following are some of the causes that they are postulated to be the cause. Genetics plays a role because people are genetically prone to autoimmune diseases. Environmental stress is clearly established as one of the factors which either precipitates or aggravates an autoimmune disease. Infections, a primary infection with some disease could then pave way for the body to get into an autoimmunity leading to the damage of a tissue. Diet and hormones, because females are found to be far higher susceptible to autoimmune diseases than males, so estrogen is considered to be one of the factors that is responsible for the higher prevalence of autoimmunity among females. Autoimmunity can at attack a specific organ or several organs or the entire body. Common autoimmune diseases which are very popularly known, or sorry, notoriously known, are rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, psoriasis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus and so on. The list is long. There is a report which says that autoimmune diseases are on the rise. Autoimmune diseases that affect the neurological diseases are growing at the rate of about 6% per annum. Gastrointestinal related immune disorders are growing at about 8%. Endocrinological uh, immune related diseases are growing at the rate of 6.3%. And rheumatic uh, autoimmune diseases are growing at the rate of 7.14 plus or minus 1.5. And the diseases, this is based on a survey done in several countries, predominantly the Western countries. I don't find so much data emerging from the Southeast or from the Asian region. Uh, diseases from the neurological segment include multiple sclerosis, which is like growing tremendously in the West. Myasthenia gravis as well. Autoimmune hepatitis, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, celiac disease affecting the gastrointestinal system. Endocrinological diseases like autoimmune, thyroiditis, insulin-dependent diabetes, mellitus. 
And the rheumatic spectrum of diseases, there's just a few that is mentioned there, starting from rheumatoid arthritis and SLE to a whole host of connective tissue autoimmune disorders. They are all on the rise. A study shows but the rise is more in the north and west compared to the south and east. So we are relatively protected, but still the difference is not too high. When it is about 7.5 in the west, it's about 4.5 in the east. So we are not uh, very well off, though we are slightly, we seem to be slightly better than the north and west. So autoimmune diseases are the biggest threats uh, which are looming large. So let's look at what Ayurveda talks about immunity. As my previous speaker, Dr. Gangadharan spoke, Ayurveda has a comprehensive understanding of what is known as a Vyadhik Shamaktva. It does not include just immune system. The biggest beauty about what Ayur, how Ayurveda looks at it and how Western medicine looks at it is, I think, the biggest difference. In Western medicine or in modern science, we tend to isolate immunity and look at it as a standalone entity. Whereas in Ayurveda, we look at immunity as part of the overall ability of the body to remain healthy and to prevent diseases. So we don't specifically call this as immunity alone. There are several components. In immunity, as we understand it today, is just a part of the whole system that the body has to prevent diseases and be healthy. So, we, we, so this is a slide that my previous speaker has dealt with, so I would skip that. The concept of ojas. This is one of the most important principles that Ayurveda talks about as the fundamental uh, ability that the body has to fight diseases. Ojas is described in Ayurveda as one of the critical components in a human system, responsible for the ability of the body to prevent diseases. It's considered to be the final product formed from the process of form formation of the tissues from the food that we eat. So in short, what we are saying is, the food that is processed by the body and which leads to the tissue formation is what creates the ability of the body to fight diseases. Today there's a growing body of uh, genetics that is called epigenetics that's completely correlating with what Ayurveda has understood for years. Factors in food can even change our genetic profile. After decoding the genes, we thought we are on the top of the world and we can do anything with health. But now we realize that a genetic profile of somebody is changing with respect to the type of food one is eating. This has been understood in Ayurveda thousands of years back when we say that it is ultimately the food which makes us, and then if we have to be healthy, it's starting from what we eat, what makes us healthy. And the normalcy of ojas in terms of its quality and quantity is critical for the prevention of diseases and the repair of damage to the body. So this is so simply stated in Ayurveda. There was never the concept of all the different components of the immune system as we understand it today, but they understood the crux of the matter as to what really are the inputs that affect your ability to fight diseases and what happens if you lose that particular ability. This is a beautiful uh, uh, flow chart that Ayurveda describes on what happens and how do you get an ability to fight diseases which ends up in the formation of that ability to be healthy which is the formation of ojas. So it all starts with our digestive process or the Agni which in turn is affected by internal factors that is our own constitution and the external factors which all affect the dynamics in the body with respect to Vata, Pitta and Gapha. So the state of an individual, what, what particular type of diet is suitable to his internal constitution and in line with what is happening in his environment around him is what really affects the way your digestive system metabolizes. This is the root cause of most of the confusion in the world today regarding nutrition. We constantly keep hearing about substances which are good for health and substances that are bad for health. Both are wrong because no food is good for everyone and no food is bad for everyone. Food is suitable to somebody with respect to a concept, with respect to a context. For a particular person, in a particular situation, something could be very, very uh, uh, good for him in a particular context, whereas the same food could become inappropriate in a different context. So always things have to be looked at from a holistic perspective rather than in isolation. And this concept of looking at it just in a, in a, as an isolated entity is the cause of most of the confusion. Where we have been contradicting our own views about this is good and then few years later it becomes very bad or vice versa. So it's all with respect to the context in which it is viewed. So Ayurveda talks about this interplay between the external factors and the internal factors which affects his digestive and metabolic process which has been given a word Agni 
or fire. So the fire in the body acts on the food or ahara, converting it into two primarily. It is supposed to be either made part of the body which is called as the dhatu. The tissues in the bodies are called as the dhatu. So the food is converted into the, the part of the body. And there is definitely a component of food which cannot be made as part of the body and it becomes the waste or the malas. Inadvertently, there is a component of food which is not compatible with the system, which is not capable of being converted into part of the body, and it's also not possible for the body to eliminate, and that is called as ama. Ama, or in other words, it is the toxin that we understand in Ayurveda. So these substances are very difficult for the body to handle. It's not possible for the body to either keep it as part of itself, nor is the body capable of throwing it out of the system. And it is this concept of ama, that is the cause of several diseases. Whereas, if the proper elimination of the malas and extinguishing of the ama takes place, the body naturally produces all the dhatus or the tissues in the right quality and quantity, which in turn leads to the concept of ojas, which is the ability of the body to protect itself from diseases and degeneration. So what does ojas have to do with immunity? Ayurveda clearly says that depletion of ojas leads to immunodeficiency. Your ability to fight diseases goes down when your ojas in the body comes down. And Ayurveda also describes what causes your ojas to go down. Psychological factors like sadness, stress, etc. are known to lower your ojas. It is very, very common to see that children before their exams fall sick. It is the stress of the exam which completely distresses their immune system and makes them prone to diseases. Children with asthma develop asthma when they are put to stress. Anybody who is undergoing stress in his day-to-day -day life will see his psoriasis getting worse and so on. Dietary factors, inadequate or improper nutrition is known to completely affect uh, immune system. It was also evident from my previous slide which talked about secondary immunity becoming low with respect to poor nutrition. Physical factors like extreme exhaustion or even extreme uh, environmental stress can completely derange the immune system and age. Old age leads to reduction in ojas. All these factors have been mentioned in the Ayurvedic classics and that's the way we understand ojas. So the normal state of ojas leads to the capacity to resist diseases. This is a particular depiction of how several diseases today, why we are mainly concerned not with, not so much about the infections, we are more concerned about the four red areas there. That is the metabolic diseases, the immunological diseases, degenerative diseases and cancer. And you can see the web of arrows that are going here and there. More, all of them are playing a great role of, you know, interacting with each other. Unwholesome diet directly leads to metabolic derangement. Improper activity and rest also complicates the metabolic system and directly it leads to metabolic diseases. And this metabolic derangement also impacts the immune system, leading to immunological diseases. Whereas the biggest culprit there is stress. Stress directly is known to increase the corticosteroid production in the body, which leads to an exaggerated or a suppressed immune system, and which in turn leads to a number of immunological problems. And you can see this great interplay between the different causative factors and how they produce the diseases which are becoming the problem of the day. Exposure to toxins is one of the subjects which is completely ignored when we talk about health because Ayurveda talks about this concept where we continue to accumulate toxins in the system. Both from food and environment, it is not necessary. Even if you eat the cleanest food, there is still a process of metabolism in the body which itself is capable of creating toxins in the system and they need to be eliminated. Ayurveda talks about how this can be done Body has a natural capacity to eliminate itself given the right type of lifestyle. We need to sleep our eight hours and in time. We need to have light food at least once in a while. We cannot stuff ourselves and expect our immune system to automatically take care of itself. So Ayurveda talks about this interplay and this is how Ayurveda interprets autoimmune diseases. Autoimmunity according to Ayurveda is understood to be amaja or caused by these toxins. These toxins are produced either through food that is not compatible with the individual or through the disease process itself resulting in what we call as the dosha kopa or abnormal physiological processes triggered by extrinsic factors or diseases. In a particular constitution, a particular person is more prone to be upset in a particular dimension through the external factors. For example, some people will suffer from 
the effect of cold very easily, whereas some others would suffer from heat or different types of foods and so on. And the response is not equal among all different patients. So there is a growing body of evidence that suggests that the internal bacterial toxins and in incompatibility to several foods, especially to gluten and milk products, are responsible for several immunological and neurodegenerative diseases. So much so that if you go to the West today, and if somebody is asked, and he says, I'm eating a very healthy food, and you ask him, what do you do? He says, I don't eat gluten, or I don't eat milk products. That's considered the most healthy food today. It's a big controversy. Ayurveda talks about milk as one of the most healthy things to be eaten, whereas today milk is considered a toxin. I was puzzled by why, what's happening. But now at least we know the reason that most of the milk today is coming from genetically modified cows. And the, the protein structure of the milk has been completely changed, which is now known to cause immunostimulation and leading to a number of immune, autoimmune diseases. So the factors that are causing very, very great problems are very fundamental. They lie in the roots, and that's what Ayurveda talks about. And the AMA represents, as according to the Ayurvedic description, there are the two formats or two methods by which the AMA is formed in the body. One is the antigens that are generated directly as a result of improper diet, as we talk about the glutens or the, uh, the milk products of the world. And those that are produced by disease processes or altered physiology, which is the pro-inflammatory cytokines as we know them to be. Modern understanding of AMA we do have some level of understanding today of what could be some of the components that represent AMA, though we don't know the entire spectrum as yet. AMA of the former description correlates with the entities that are not metabolized in the normal process. The, lympho, the lipophilic, sorry, there is a typographical error, the, the T has gone there. Anyway, the lipophilic and the hydrophobic substances that the body is not able to eliminate without engaging the phase one or phase two detoxification systems. That's the natural system that the body has through the liver, which is able to detoxify the body. So these systems have to be engaged if you want to eliminate these substances that are soluble only in fat and they don't dissolve in water. Body naturally is capable of removing the water-soluble components, whereas the fat-soluble components are more difficult for the body to, to remove, and they get accumulated in the body. The majority of carcinogens come under this category. So I think this represents the AMA that is produced by the first process. AMA due to disease process or dosha interaction correlates with the pro-inflammatory factors and metabolic processes that lead to free radical generation and thereby to tissue damage. The AMA that is generated in the first process also leads to tissue damage after entering into the second phase which is that of free radical generation. So what is the Ayurvedic approach to prevent diseases? I would not now isolate diseases into immunological diseases alone. Because we know that it's a continuum and immuno, immunological disturbance is just but one part of the whole continuum. So Ayurveda talks about how do you remain healthy, how do you, of course, as my previous speaker Dr. Gangadharan spoke about, there is a dinacharya, what you do on a daily basis, what you do on a seasonal basis to keep yourself healthy and so on. But in effect, what we are talking about is a balanced diet, lifestyle and nutrition. Of course, nutrition and diet are the same. So we talk about a very balanced diet and lifestyle which is a fundamental building block of health. We talk about the periodic detoxification as a critical component if somebody is trying to be healthy. We talk about correction of functional derangements at a very early age. I think this is a very small thing which is often neglected. We don't get sleep and we think, okay, so what? I have more time to work. Or we don't feel digestion properly and we think, so what? I may probably lose weight by eating less, but that's not the case. These small things are but the language of the body telling you that I am not working in the optimal method. And Ayurveda says that when these doshas are upset to a small level, you tackle them, they don't cause permanent damage. But once they go out of balance beyond a certain level, it's very difficult to bring them back to absolute normalcy. So these are very, very important concepts in Ayurveda where we say even the smallest imbalance that is happening in the body, body is trying to communicate to you. If you're feeling uh, uneasy, you have eaten something that is not very compatible, you didn't feel good about it, you feel like throwing up, and then you think, oh, I'm vomiting and I should stop it. Don't stop if you're vomiting by yourself. You know, body is actually throwing out toxins. So if you're vomiting, please don't take something to suppress your vomiting, or if you're purging once or twice, don't take a medicine to address uh, or to stop the tendency to purge. Body is actually detoxifying you, and if you say, I, do, I want to take something to prevent that, you're accumulating toxins in the body. 
So Ayurveda has understood that these natural processes are there in the body and that's why Ayurveda uses these processes to detoxify the body. We induce medically, we in, with medicines we induce vomiting. With medicines we induce purgation to detoxify the body of doshas as we understand to be caused due to kapha and pitta respectively. And the most important function in Ayurveda is to administer what we call as vasti or the enemas which is supposed to detoxify the most subtle of toxins that accumulate in the system. We also have a very important concept of de-stressing. I mean, de-stressing was not called as de-stressing per se, but all the therapies in Ayurveda are always a component of what can really de-stress the body, both in the beginning as well as in the end of the session. I think I'm running short of time, so I'll rush through my slides. So rejuvenation or rasayana or building up of ojas, there are certain herbs and so on, which can help build immunity. So we talk about balance, as I mentioned earlier, so I would not go through this in detail, and detox, which I said is one of the most important things. Ayurveda talks about detox from three perspectives. One is if, depending on the level of toxicity. If you've got a mild toxicity that is just getting generated, langhanam, or just giving yourself light food and allowing the body to detoxify itself is good enough. If there is toxicity of a moderate intensity, you need to do this langhanam as well as the process called pajanam, which comprises of administering certain herbs, which helps the liver detoxify better. And if the toxicity is of a higher intensity, or if the toxicity is very well settled into the tissues, we need to follow what Ayurveda talks about as the shodhanam, or the eliminative procedures. So langhanam is just about a fast, you know, you can find any sort of spiritual system in the world talking about a fast once in a while. Or taking diet that is very light, comprising of warm soups or gruels with complete rest. So this sort of an environment is absolutely necessary for the body to be able to detoxify itself. The body then is capable of handling the toxins on its own by engaging the natural detoxification systems. And then comes pajanam or the administration of certain herbs which help the liver to detoxify itself. Several herbs have been mentioned in Ayurveda, most of the bitter ones, uh, guduchi, shunti, musta, bhumi, uh, bhunimba, dhanyaka and so on and so forth. Then we talk about shodhanam or the five main eliminative procedures that Ayurveda talks about. Medically induced emesis, medically induced purgation, enema with herbal decoctions, nasal uh, irrigation. And rectamokshanam or bloodletting is not used as a regular detoxification. It's only used in diseases that are resistant to even those other forms of detoxification. Okay, this is just a picture of how the nasim is done. So as I said, correcting the functional derangements from its source is another very important concept that Ayurveda talks about to prevent major diseases from happening. De-stressing, Ayurveda has become very popular world over mainly for this now because you just do Shirodhara. People know that the stress levels are coming down and there are wonderful studies that show that as well. There are herbs and herbal preparations as well which help in improving the, the ability of the body to combat stress. Breathing techniques, yoga and pranayama is all about de-stress and mental approaches like counseling are also needed. It's not always just enough to do the others. Sometimes you need to talk to somebody who can understand you and empathize with you. Rasayana or rejuvenation is a very important aspect of remaining healthy or preventing immune diseases. Ayurveda has a number of herbs like Amla. Okay, I'm sorry, I've not given the botanical names. It's the gooseberry. Hariteki is another uh, fruit which is quite uh, astringent and bitter. Ashwagandha is popularly known. It's called the Indian Jinxen. And there are the herbal formulations uh, like Chavanaprasa, Brahma Rasayana, Agastya Rasayana and Tripala, which are very, very potent in improving the immune status of a patient. Physical treatments like Navarakiri, Tailadhara, Chiravasti are also rejuvenative and strengthening in nature. Some of the immunological diseases that we are currently treating very successfully at several Ayurvedic facilities include people who keep getting frequent infections, respiratory infections, urinary tract infections and so on. Hypersensitivity, we do get a lot of patients and treat people with allergic rhinitis, bronchitis, asthma, urticaria, etc. Even those who are resistant to regular medication we are able to see that Ayurvedic treatment is able to provide some good relief to them. And the serious range of autoimmune diseases, we do treat Hashimoto's thyroiditis. We have very good treatment for psoriasis, eczema, alopecia, contact dermatitis, ulcerative colitis, pernicious anemia, multiple sclerosis, and so on. There's a whole spate of people coming from the West to India and so on in seeking treatment for these diseases. And to, not to mention the rheumatic spectrum of diseases starting from rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing, spondylitis, uh, SLE, and so on and so forth. Research, uh, I would just conclude by 
highlighting some of the research findings that are being published in Ayurveda in the area of immunity. There is research that's being done on the herbs. There's research that's being done on the polyherbal traditional formulations. Research that's done on the therapeutic processes and treatment of autoimmune diseases. I'll just highlight some of the studies. There are very good studies showing the effects of Tinospora cordifolia. Vithania somnifera or the Indian ginseng has been studied by Bhushan Patwardhan, uh, Dr. Chandran and so on and published in the Journal of Ethnopharmacology. Uh, immunomodulatory activity of Vithania somnifera, that study is uh, published. Mangifera indica has got several indications published by good studies. Immunomodulatory effect of the alcoholic extracts of uh, Mangifera indica. Uh, immunomodulatory and anti-tumor activity of Piper longum has been studied very well and it has also been used to improve the efficacy of anti-tubercular therapy. India has developed a model of how by adding Piper longum extract to that you can reduce the, the duration of anti-tubercular therapy. I'm sorry, I'm overstepping, I'm almost through. So traditional Ayurvedic products like Brahma Rasayana are shown to be very effective in improving the antioxidant system as well as in cancer therapy. Very interesting Shirodhara, which is, the, which is I think the highlight of Ayurveda. Everywhere you talk about Ayurveda, you see the picture of Shirodhara. And there is a wonderful study done by Professor Yubeba from the Kyoto University in Japan, which shows the psychoneuroimmunological effects of the Ayurvedic oil dripping therapy or Shirodhara. A study has also been, uh, this is the highlight of what we have today to offer in terms of the research, in terms of Ayurveda's efficiency in treating autoimmune diseases. A study by Professor First and uh, colleagues, which has been done at the Ayurveda Pharmacy Coimbatore on rheumatoid arthritis has been the first of its kind, where it was published in the American Journal of Rheumatology, showing how Ayurvedic treatment comprising just the medicines without any panchakarma, without any of the inpatient treatments, with just medicines, how Ayurvedic treatment was compared with methotrexate. So it was a completely double-blind, uh, randomized control study where methotrexate plus Ayurveda was placed in one arm, Ayurveda and methotrexate placebo in one, and Ayurveda plus methotrexate in the other. And the outcomes included the modern standards of uh, diagnosing disease activity like DAS-28, CRP, DAS-28, ESR, uh, ACR-20, 50 criteria, and so on. And finally, the results were that all groups were comparable at baseline in demographics and disease characteristics. At the baseline, they were all the same. And in efficacy-wise, also, they turned out to be same. While methotrexate produced an 86% change in ACR20, Ayurveda produced a 100% change in ACR20. Combinations were 82% as effective. So it showed that statistically, though, there was not much of a difference. All groups were equally effective in controlling rheumatoid arthritis. And in the DAS-20 response as well, they were all statistically similar. Regarding the adverse drug reactions, there was no difference between the groups, but numerically, the methotrexate group had 174 abnormalities or ADRs reported, while Ayurveda uh, arm reported only about 112 ADRs, and the combination showed 176, and no deaths were reported. So this was a very highlight study which has put Ayurveda on the global map, uh, showing interest in autoimmune diseases. So to conclude, I would say it's very important to look at health and immunity from a holistic perspective, as opposed to looking at it in fragments. Abnormality of the immune system is only one of the aspects of the multiple interconnected pathological processes that play a role in the causation of the so-called immunological diseases. Diet, lifestyle, detox, and rejuvenation, rejuvenative herbs and formulations play a vital role in preventing many of those diseases. And Ayurvedic intervention comprising of all the above along with herbal medication and Ayurvedic therapeutic procedures, could be a very powerful alternative or an adjuvant to conventional medicine in immunological diseases. Thank you very much for the patient hearing. Thank you.